I actually saw this years ago. Mm -hmm. I was uh, at, at Mount Scopus in the archaeology library, and there was this guy who would just sit there day after day after day after day, mm -hmm. as many of us did, reading. And one day he he gets up and he and he shouts, "Eureka! I found it!" <laughs> Shalom and welcome to Hebrew Gospel Pearls, episode 26, where we will be speaking about Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. I, what, are you, what are you doing? You're playing cards? I'm holding my hand. You're holding your hand. I'm holding in my hand. Matthew 5, 19, one of my favorite verses in the Gospel of Matthew, and I'm, I'm excited to talk about this. I can't Matthew wait. Matthew 5, 19 is a game changer. It's, a game, it's a game changer, Nehemiah. And I'm going to tell you what. The reason I'm holding these cards is, you know how people say they hold their cards close to their chest? Okay. No more holding the cards close to the chest. I'm going to tell you what's in my hand. What's in your hand? Do you ever play poker? Not really. Have you never played poker or anything? I've got five cards. I think when I was a kid, I didn't really understand the rules. Uh, yeah, let me tell you this. What do you think is <laughs> the best hand you could get out of five cards? Like a royal flush? That's pretty darn good. Maybe, is there something better? Uh, I mean... Uh, I'll tell you what I have in my hand. What's that? King high, first of all. Okay. And four aces. Is that the highest? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, no, this is like huge. I mean, this, okay. is, this is huge. Four aces. The reason I'm saying this, Nehemiah, is that 519 <laughs> was where you literally did something. And I, I know folks hear me say, change the game, but you literally changed the game. And I actually mm -hmm. sent a picture to you, and I want you to be able to share mm. this picture. Because... Um, what you did was when uh, you called from 518, you said, okay, Keith, well, let's study together again. I said, well, how are we going to study together again? And this is going to open up a door for you to do some explain, some explaining. Some you have to do some explaining. Okay. So you said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, and then we're going to check it letter by letter. Put, put up the picture, Nehemiah. Okay. If you can. So here's the picture you asked me to put up. So tell us what we got what here. What has got here, and I want you to help explain this. So mm -hmm. there's three things that I have here. This is my desk. Mm -hmm. This is you saying, okay, Keith, you want to get serious about studying the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew? Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what you asked me to do? This Remind over me. here is this over here is Shem Tob's Hebrew Matthew. This mm -hmm. over here is a manuscript from. That's the British Library manuscript. Absolutely. And what's that over there to the left? <laughs> so that there is from a. a a book I put together called The Naming of Jesus in Hebrew Matthew, mm -hmm. in which I went through a section of Hebrew Matthew letter by letter, showing people what kind of things you, essentially kind of helping people to understand what you would find in, in the British Library manuscript, mm -hmm. how you could read it, mm -hmm. what the different textual features are. <laughs> and so I gave actually a chart there of, you know, this is the letter Shen in this manuscript. This is what letter Tav looks like. This yes. is the final Kaf. Yes. And yeah. So, so, so basically, order, so that anybody could take any section and be able to read it for themselves. This is so amazing. So you said to me, so Keith, what we're going to do is we're going to be checking letter by letter between the manuscript, and I've got mm. that as a reminder because I'm saying what I don't remember. I mean, this is cursive. This is different than what I'm reading over there. So letter by letter, we're going to go through. We're going to go through, and then this is when I found out something about Nehemiah, guys. I found out something about Nehemiah. Every once mm -hmm. in a while, he Howards the text. No. <laughs> What do you mean he howards the text? Sometimes Nehemiah will look at the text, the Hebrew will be there, and then he'll say, ah, I'm just not 100% sure. Now, I'm going to let you explain howarding the text. But, but so, well, go ahead, and then I'll, so I'll look, give the, 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 there's a, let, Let's, to be fair to Howard, there's a challenge you have in dealing with manuscripts. You know, we, the, there's a, a scholar of the Greek New Testament who says we have this embarrassment of riches. You know, when you're dealing with a manuscript of Plato or Aristotle, you've won maybe two manuscripts, and there's not a lot of difference between the manuscripts because you only have a couple, <laughs> right? And so they might be completely corrupt or difficult to understand because something's been changed, but you would never know it because mm -hmm. you only have, to, you know, a very small number of manuscripts. You know, in the Greek New Testament, we have thousands of manuscripts. Right. In Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew, we have 28. Mm -hmm. And in this particular section we're dealing with, we have 20. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you systematically compare the manuscripts and you try to figure out, okay, what does the original 
text, maybe not what Matthew wrote in the first century, but the original text, in this case, that Shem Tov wrote in 1380, because mm-hmm. we have copies of copies of what copies. Shem Tov wrote. We don't have the autograph right. that Shem Tov himself copied, right? So we're trying to get back to that what's called the Ur text. Mm-hmm. That's a German word, U-R text, mm-hmm. the original text. In this case, the Ur text of, of Shem Tov when he copied it in around 1380. Um, So you're comparing and checking these different manuscripts and looking for the differences. Mm -hmm. And what you're looking for is errors. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to figure out, okay, if this is an error, if there's 20 manuscripts and um, 15 of them read one thing and five of them read another, and one of those seems like it's an error, then you go with the ones that make sense, Mm -hmm. right? Now, sometimes you don't. (laughs) There's a principle in textual criticism called difficilior lectio, the more difficult reading is preferable. Mm -hmm. And why would the, I mean, it doesn't even make sense. Why would that be? Why would the more difficult reading be preferable? Because it's the nature of copyists to try to make things easier. (laughs) So it's true copyists make make mistakes all the time, but it's also the nature of copyists to see something they don't understand and say, okay, I'll fix this. Mm -hmm. And and to fix what weren't really mistakes, what was intended in the first place. And, And the reason I call this Howarding, and you, I think, I hope that I think it's why you call it Howarding, mm-hmm. is really goes back to the book I wrote, the Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus. Mm-hmm. So in the Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus, uh, Matthew twenty three, it says the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, all therefore that they bid you observe that observe and do. And you look in the Hebrew text, and instead of all there there therefore that they bid you, mm-hmm. it says. Something to the effect has been years, so I'm paraphrasing it here. Uh, oh, you can read it for me, Matthew uh, uh, 23, verse 2 mm-hmm. and 3 in, in the Howard's text. But in the Hebrew, it says, Kol yomar lachem, All that he says to you, diligently do. Mm-hmm. And what Howard naturally does is he says, he says to you, who's the he? Obviously, this is a mistake, and it's supposed to be all that they say to you. And indeed, many manuscripts have they say to you. <laughs> this is- so he fixes it. Why does he fix it? Because the other version makes no sense to him. It sounds like gibberish. And if it's gibberish, you got to, you know, that happens in manuscripts. There's a mistake. Fix the mistake. I call it, we call that Howarding the text. So, so, so Nehemiah. So there, are, here, here we have Howard on the left side. We've got Hebrew. Yeah. On the right side, we have English. This is right. where he Howards it. On the left, sometimes it's right there. That oh, so in the it, Hebrew, on the left, it says all that yomar that he says. Yes. And on the right, it says they in parentheses. parentheses. Now, he, here's the beautiful thing about that example. So I have a testimony from a gentleman named Ross Nichols mm-hmm. who went to a conference where he heard Professor Howard speak. And Howard spoke about this passage. And Nichols raised his hand and he said, well, he says, and this is before I even heard of Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew or this whole issue of Matthew 23. This was years before that. He says, well, Professor Howard, but what if it is he says, referring to Moses? And Howard said, I never thought of that. Okay. So because he never thought of it, he, did. he fixed the te- he, fixed. he fixed the text air quotes fixed fixed thereby he corrected it right so so this is interesting we talk about the difficult uh, version is preferable sometimes right. the difficult reading is preferable and that's because something scribes in the Middle Ages had a tendency to do which was mm-hmm. fix the text mm-hmm. i.e. change it to fit their preconceptions and understanding. Well, modern scholars do that too. Mm-hmm. And we've called that Howarding the text. And now I think Keith is about to expose me. <laughs> so, Howarding the text. So, so there are times, so I'm going- You must not no, 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 I'm gonna show <laughs> Letter by letter, letter by letter by letter. Hours letter by letter. And what I wanna say about that, Nehemi, <laughs> is you gave me a chance to do um, something that I just wouldn't have had an opportunity to do mm-hmm. had you not provided it. And you're like, yeah. okay, Keith, your job is to go behind me and go letter by letter, learning the uh, the, the the cursive in that particular manuscript. There's so many different cursive. Or semi-cursive. I mean, the semi-cursive. Yeah. Um, but then I thought to myself, you know, I wonder if there's ever been a time where Nehemiah has done this, you know, outside. And I just happened to bring this. <laughs> this is the Gospel of Matthew according to the primitive Hebrew text. If you haven't watched episode uh, 22 or 23, we talked about this. This was the first thing that Nehemiah sent me. And so in preparation for episode 19, I opened this up just for fun. And to and put it in context, I sent you that what? 
it, sometime in the early 2000s. Oh, it was, it was, yeah, a long time ago. So I, I thought to myself, I wonder if there's ever an example where the scribe, I mean, Nehemiah, I mean, Howard, I mean, well, whoever, would actually like do like a note or anything. And so it's now time for us to go to episode, this is happening in real time, folks. We are at episode number 20, what? What, what, are we on? We, <laughs> what is this what episode? Is episode 20, 26. 26. And we're reading from Matthew 5, 19, which was a game changer for me. What page me. is this? This is page number 19. Can you tell me there's some writing over the top of this, Nehemi? I don't know. We, we'll be able to show So this. here's what I did. Okay. I was at the Mount Scopus Library in Jerusalem, and I took Shem Tov's, um, I took this book of Howard, mm -hmm. the Gospel of Matthew Coiner, Primitive Hebrew Text, went down to the basement, photocopied the whole thing, mm -hmm. then made a second copy. Well, later, I made a second copy for you, but initially, I had my own copy. And as I was reading through my own copy, I came to Matthew 5.19, and I saw this word, Aleph Lamed Mem Dalet, El Ameid, that I teach, Asher El Ameid, that I teach. And I said, well, that doesn't make any sense. And I wrote in pencil, R dot, which means read, <laughs> read it, Ve Yilamed, and he will teach. Okay, folks. So I, 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 made, I corrected the text because the text so, didn't make any sense at so the time. So there, there were times. And then I sent you a photocopy, including my correction. <laughs> And I found it. <laughs> so there are times when we were going through this where we'd say, is this a Howard issue? Now, Nehemia, we're now going to 5. <laughs> yes, I Howard in the text. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. This is the beauty of having people looking at what you've always said is let's look at the source. Uh -huh. Matthew 5, 19, folks, really was a game changer because Matthew 5, 19, there's a word that potentially could be different, uh, interpreted differently. I don't want to go into great depth, Nehemia, but mm. the second thing that you did that changed the game is after we went through that whole process, you said, in order for us to send this manuscript to a vowel pointer in Israel, one of the best, we need to make sure that we have it right. And we even found some things that he did. <laughs> I think they're even in this verse. Oh, boy. So Nehemia, can you just explain just a little bit before we get into this, why it was that you said we should have this vowel pointed? Can you just... Can you just help people with that? So, first of all, I want to make, it, make this accessible to as wide an audience as possible. There it is. There well, it is. What I could do is say, uh, okay, there's 28 manuscripts. Go and learn to read a half a dozen different types of scripts. <laughs> right. uh, and you'll be able to read these yourself and you don't need me. Um, and But the average person, A, can't do that. Or, or if he could do it, not the average person, even the scholars who say, I don't have time to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I wanted to make it as accessible as possible. And so putting vowels in the text makes it possible for somebody with a uh, rudimentary knowledge of Hebrew to be mm -hmm. able to read it mm -hmm. and and understand it a, mm -hmm. a lot better than if you don't have any vowels. Mm -hmm. Now, when you put in vowels, you're also interpreting things. And that's big. Right. Now, sometimes there's only one way to read things, but other times there's multiple ways, mm -hmm. multiple potential mm -hmm. uh, potentialities with um, how you put the vowels in. And what I wanted to do is put those vowels in, show people, okay, here's one way to read it mm -hmm. based on these manuscripts. And ultimately what I want to do is have it so that people can read it from any manuscript. There you go. Right? In other words, there are technologies out there that we're still exploring where you could say, you know what, I want to see what manuscript C says and have that text with full vowels. Mm -hmm. I want to see manuscript F click a button, have that with full vowels. Mm -hmm. I want to see manuscript C compared to manuscript F. Mm -hmm. And dynamically, this software can then put, now we don't have that software yet. We're mm -hmm. working with some people to try to uh, apply that to um, Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. Um, but make it so that people have access to this kind of, and I'm looking here at a spreadsheet, literally an Excel spreadsheet yes. that has hundreds and hundreds of columns. And each column is a different word in a different manuscript. And this kind of blew me away when we were preparing this. Uh, we were originally talking about doing all of chapter five, <laughs> beginning in verse 13 through the end. Yeah. And I said, Keith, this is over 10,000 data points. Yeah. Right? Is there's, there's, you know, X number of words times 20 manuscripts. And starting in verse 27, there's more than 20 manuscripts. Mm -hmm. This is over 10,000 data points. This is going to take a little bit longer than, mm -hmm. than we, we, we anticipated. Um, and so we, you know, kind of took a, a smaller section and did it in more detail. Um, but so the purpose of the vowels for me is number one, make it accessible. And number two, to provide people with the different understandings of what, of different ways to read it. Cause sometimes, and this is what happened initially when I made that Howard correction in the text, I Howarded the text. Cause I read the text as it appeared 
with my preconceptions of what I thought it should say, and it made zero sense to me. So I said, this has to be an error, and I corrected it. Now, maybe it is an error. My correction was right. Mm -hmm. But I, what, I want, what I want to do is say, okay, here's the text we have. What does it mean based on the way it's written? Mm -hmm. You know, th this was actually a profound experience I had when I was studying at Hebrew University. I had this class, and in the class, the professor was talking about one of the great scholars of the mid 20th century who was a professor at Hebrew University. Mm -hmm. And what he was famous for was correcting the text. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean the correct of the Gospel of Matthew, he was correcting the text of Amos, he was correcting the text of Isaiah, he was correcting the text of the Torah. <laughs> He would read a passage and say, that can't be what it means. And he would modify the text to fit his understanding of what it should mean. Mm -hmm. This type of correction is called an emendation. And that's a technical term in, uh, in textual criticism. Emendation doesn't just mean you amended the text. Mm -hmm. It means you change the text based on conjecture. Mm -hmm. Conjecture meaning you don't have a manuscript that says that, but that's what you think the text should say. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm studying in this class during my master's degree in Hebrew University, and we're talking about this uh, professor, Tor Sinai, who was famous for changing the text. And he says, what do we have that professor Tor Sinai didn't have? Mm -hmm. And everyone's trying to say, oh, we, had the Va we have the Vatican manuscript. Another person says, no, we've got the Paris manuscript. Mm -hmm. Well, now we've got the Aleppo Codex. Mm -hmm. And the professor said, no, what we have is the text the way it was written. And what Tour Sinai had was a text of his own creation. <laughs> and that really struck me to my core. And I made a decision that whenever I was dealing with the text, I wanted to deal with the text as it's come down to us. Mm -hmm. Now, there are situations where you have no choice but to insert emendations. Yeah. Where, in other words, a change based on a conjecture or a change based on an actual manuscript, which is always preferable, mm -hmm. right? Therefore, when it's based on a manuscript, it's not your uh, conjecture, it's based on evidence, right? But even then, you have to consider all the evidence and say, all right, some manuscripts have this, some have that, and what is your reason for accepting A versus B. Mm -hmm. Well, I accept B because B makes more sense to me. Well, what does A mean? Does it have a meaning at all mm -hmm. or is it just gibberish? Mm -hmm. And look, sometimes it's gibberish, right? Right. And you have no choice but to, you know, to amend the text or to go with the readings of one manuscript over the other. So I'm gonna give you just the two cards. First card, Nehemia says, Keith, I'm gonna let you be my assistant editor of the Hebrew Matthew Project. That's King High. Second thing, Nehemia says, we're going to get this vowel pointed. That's my first ace. Okay. Now, let's start talking about 519. I want you to read it in English. I, yeah. mean, I want you to read it in Hebrew and read it in English. And mm -hmm. then let's get into why okay. you make certain decisions. Yeah. Now, you mentioned about our, our um, vowel pointer. Yes. And, and we actually dug up the email. <laughs> I have a, a screenshot here of the email. that I, I don't know if I should show the screenshot, but uh, at least I'll read it. Um, yeah. Uh, no, I'm going to show the screenshot. Um, so this is from the, the he, and this guy is a brilliant scholar. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I said to him <laughs> yeah, on March 28th, 2017 <laughs> at 1248 PM. Wait, 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 it was like 2017, right? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I said, I said, by the way, do not change the consonants. <laughs> Your job is to put in vowels. Do not change the consonants. Even if you find mistakes, because that is what was in the manuscript that I copied from. And I bring him an, bring him an example where it makes zero sense right. in the text. I shouldn't say zero, but it makes very little sense. Uh, and I said, obviously it should be read this other way, but I want to represent the uh, consonantal text exactly as it was in the manuscript, appears in the manuscript, <laughs> as the manuscript that I found. So... We have very specific instructions. Very specific. Do by the way, not change the vowel. 90, the consonants 90, only put in vowels. 95% of what he did? Perfecto. Perfecto. A couple percentage he in Howard some it. some of the places. <laughs> he didn't even Howard it. No, he didn't Howard it. At least Howard yeah. is saying, look, this text doesn't make sense. I've got to change it based on my own conjecture or based on other manuscripts that mm -hmm. I have. Mm -hmm. What our language editor did, who put in the vowels, is he said, well, look, and maybe he even did this subconsciously. Mm -hmm. He said to himself, I think, 
Well, the Academy of the Hebrew Language has established a certain set of rules mm -hmm. for how to write a Hebrew text that has vowels in it. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to be written a different way when there's no vowels in it. Mm -hmm. That's a standard that's established by the Academy of the Hebrew Language. Mm -hmm. And there were cases where he changed the consonants of the text because he said, this vowel's here, we don't need this extra yud. This vowel's here, we don't need this extra vav. Well, the vav is an, vav is an extra, it's in the manuscript. You've right. got to represent it. Right. Because, I mean, that was your instructions. Right. And I think probably on an unconscious level, he did that. He made it fit not just his preconceptions, but the set of rules that he'd been trained in. Mm -hmm. And he's one of the top people in the world mm -hmm. to, to point according to these rules. But for our purposes, it was, and look, I mean, he did this over a period of, of, of some a significant amount of time. Maybe he didn't remember what I wrote in an email in 2017, right, right? Right, right, And so he's like, okay, I see there's an extra yud here. Let me take that out and put in the vowel, an extra vav. But what's I'll, amazing- I'll, I'll, put in, is, I'll put in a kubus instead of a shuruk and, you know. We're able to find out where those things were done. Right. Now we read 519. Okay. And we found the original file that we sent him because at first we were like, well, maybe we did this. I don't, yeah. maybe we, maybe- a mistake. Maybe Nehemiah miscopied it. Yeah. And we found the file we sent him in the email in, 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 you know, from 2017, and we proved definitively that he was the one who changed our text. Yeah. So the text is going to have to go through some, uh, some changes. So yeah. revisions to, yes. to fix it. Yep. Um, all right. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Can I read the NASB before you do it? Absolutely. The NASB says, Therefore, whoever nullifies one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, italics to do the same, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, italics, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Howard, verse 19. <clears throat> he who shall transgress one word of these commandments, parentheses, and shall teach, close parentheses, others, shall be called a vain person, parentheses, in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever upholds and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That's Howard. And parentheses in Howard means that's not what's in the Hebrew text on the other side of his page. It's generally based on readings from other manuscripts that he has in the, the notes in the mm -hmm. lower part of mm -hmm. the, the, the page in the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, or it's what he thinks it should say. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, 19. Vashil, and this is based on the comparison of the 20 surviving manuscripts. This is good. Um, and let's see, is it actually 20 for this particular verse? Mm -hmm. Let me just see here. Uh, I don't remember... Oh, yeah, it's exactly 20 manuscripts. V'ashel ya'avor ma'amar echad mea mitzvot ela, or mi mitzvot ela. And then here we have two major different versions. I'll read each of them. Asher elamed acherim, or acherim, ken hevel yikra malchut shamayim, or yikare malchut shamayim, b'malchut shamayim. V'amekayim v'amelamed gadol yikare b'malchut shamayim. All right, so there's a lot of, you know, we went through whole verses where there was no difference between any of the manuscripts. This one's golden, look at it. Here there are huge differences. Mm -hmm. Here we have a subfamily, which is five manuscripts, which uh, the main one is manuscript, the British Library manuscript, the one that Howard uses as base text. And why is that the main manuscript? Really just because Howard used it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I would actually argue that manuscript V is more important than Z. So we have five manuscripts that are part of a subfamily. All of those manuscripts are part of family B, but within family B is the subfamily. Mm -hmm. And four of these manuscripts have a very interesting characteristic. Mm -hmm. And that characteristic is they don't have the complete gospel of Matthew, they all end in Matthew chapter 23. I believe it's verse 22. Mm -hmm. And now if one manuscript ends in Matthew 23, 22, okay, the, I'm sure the rest of it was there. Right. And the rat came right. and ate okay. those pages or bookworms came right. and ate those pages or they got wet, they fell off. And that happens all the time. You know, what are you missing in many of your books, those who still have print books? The beginning of the book and the end of the book, right? It's very, very common and extremely common with manuscripts where you had literally bookworms mm -hmm. that would come and eat parts of it and you had mold and all kinds of things and you'd lose pages. So if one manuscript's missing the rest of Matthew after chapter 20, the end of 23 and the, and the rest of the gospel, okay, it was a worm or something like that, or mold, or water damage. Well, we have four manuscripts that all end in Matthew 23, 22. Mm -hmm. What does that tell you? That means they're all copied from a single source. Mm -hmm. 
And it's possible that that source is one of those four manuscripts. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is the fifth member of that group, manuscript V, is identical in almost every detail to the other four, except it goes all the way to the end of Matthew. <laughs> now, you can be sure manuscript V was not copied from those other four, because it didn't, and where else would it yeah. get the end of Matthew? Right. right. It didn't get it from the British Library manuscript. Right. The British Library manuscript doesn't have it. So this subfamily of manuscripts, and look, Howard only knew about two of these, Z and C. He didn't know about N, T, and V. Mm -hmm. um, Where are those from? Uh, different places. Yep. Um, yep. I'd have to look up what the, I don't remember off the top of my head what yep. those codes stand for. Uh, right, it's 28. I can't remember where they all, I have a list. Yeah. Um, so uh, all five of those manuscripts, the, the Z subgroup, mm -hmm. or maybe the V subgroup, it's better to call it, mm -hmm. um, they all have a different reading than the rest of the manuscripts. All of the other manuscripts have, um, let's see, it's he who violates one word from these commandments. So everybody agrees on that so far, right? That's essentially identical in all the manuscripts. You know you didn't give us the English of your Hebrew. Oh, I didn't? No. Oh, I, I, th I think I did it on purpose because you didn't want to go to the controversy. Oh, no, I thought, I thought I had translated it yes, because no. I was reading it yeah. and understood it. All right, so let's, let, let's, <laughs> let's, read the, let's read the two possibilities, okay? Did you guys hear what he just said? Right. So, so <laughs> let's more. read the two possibilities. Yeah. So let's read first the majority reading, yes. which is both families A and B. Remember yep. we talked about those two families? Yep. A and B both have um, the same thing. Uh, more or less, right? Yep. I mean, there's some differences. He who violates one of uh, these commandments, and some manuscripts have the least of these, uh, the uh, smallest of these commandments, mm -hmm. and shall teach others, son of emptiness, and we'll come back to son of emptiness, son of vanity, son of emptiness, he will be called in the kingdom of heaven. And he who keeps and teaches great, he will be called in the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. That's the majority reading with some, uh, well, with some, with minor variations, right? Mm -hmm. Some of the manuscripts don't have the word least or small. Mm -hmm. They just have one of these, um, ma -ma, one of these, uh, the, the, the saying of one of these commandments. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them have the, the small, one small saying of these commandments, right? It's a slight difference. But other than that, that is the reading you're going to find in 15 of the manuscripts. What's interesting, by the way, mentioning our our, uh, our vocalizer. So the word for these, this is a very trivial point, right? But the word for these in the manuscripts is elu, aleph, lam, and vav. He changed it to aleph, lam, and hey, ela. Because mm -hmm. ela is standard in modern Hebrew. But the manuscript, all 20 of the manuscripts say <laughs> elu. Actually, one of them, there's a wor literally a worm that ate part of it, so we don't know. But 19 of the manuscripts have elu or ha elu. Yeah. Uh, so he actually changed a consonant for based on what he considered to be standard Hebrew grammar, um, modern Hebrew grammar, and we're trying to represent what's in the manuscripts. Yeah. All right, now here is where the difference comes. So teaches one of the least of these commandments or the smallest of these commandments, or literally it's one, one word of this, uh, or once. So it's either one word of these commandments or one small word of these commandments, mm -hmm. right? And then there's two versions here. The majority version, both families A and B, says, Vilamed acherim ken, and shall teach others so, hevel yikare b'malchut shemayim. Emptiness he will be called in the kingdom of heaven. Now we're going to get back to emptiness, and so mm -hmm. let's not focus on that for a minute. Um, but he will teach others. In other words, anybody who violates one small word of these commandments, or just one of these commandments, whether it's small or not, right? it's two different versions, and shall teach others so, he will be called Hevel in the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. He will be called vanity, emptiness, mm -hmm. breath in the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the majority reading. Then we have the Z subgroup, which is five manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And when I originally read this, I said, this is an obvious textual error. It's an obvious mistake. It makes no sense. Read it, Vila made, according to the majority. And that's what you found there um, in that photocopy of my photocopy where I wrote notes, right? <laughs> you I'm were saying. Ma you're a Masoret. I, well, I was a Masoret. I was a Howard here, but you know. All right. <laughs> you were giving me notes. I was Howarding it, right? Yeah. Um, however, later I asked the question all right, I understand that this could be a mistake, but what if it's not a mistake? If it's not a mistake, what could this possibly mean? Mm -hmm. 
right? We, this is, you know, what, what do I have that this scholar, which, which Torsi and I didn't have? I have the text that has come down to us, mm-hmm. right? Instead of creating and fashioning a text according to my own understanding of what it should be, is there some way I can make sense of the text, mm-hmm. right? And maybe it is an error, mm-hmm. but let's first consider the possibility that it's not. And I realized I had this incredible realization that, wait, this could make perfect sense. And what would it mean, the Z group representing five manuscripts, he who violates one word of these commandments, that I teach, acharim, I will utterly destroy. Now, if you read it as acharim, others, which is what it would mean in the context of the other 15 manuscripts, yeah, it makes no sense, right? Why doesn't it make sense? Because it would mean he who violates one word of these commandments that I teach others, that I teach others, I don't know what sense it can make, right? Maybe it does make sense to somebody. To me, it was kind of like what Howard said, yeah, Matthew 23, 2 to 3 doesn't make sense. Let's put the correct the correct translation in parentheses because mm-hmm. our Hebrew doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. But I realized who's, we don't know what the vowels are. We don't have the vowels in the, in the, in the Shem Tov text. And maybe it is, maybe it, what it means is um, acharim rather than acherim. Acharim is from the word cherem, to destroy. Acharim I will utterly destroy. So could be, that be what Yeshua is saying? So, card number three. Yes. When you said to me that mm-hmm. there was the possibility of that for 519, what I said to myself is there's no way we can deal with that translation unless we look at all, the, all of the possibilities of what you're actually looking at. And what you mm-hmm. did, I want to say thank you again, Nehemiah, because you brought in Nelson, who's, who was a research assistant, and we sat down and we went for hours. I mean, I'm literally, we literally went back and forth on this verse. Mm-hmm. And I want people to get a chance in, in this next section to do what, what I did with you, what, what you did with Nelson and I. And what you did, literally, I, I just say this, it changes the game for appreciation mm-hmm. of these manuscripts, and not only the manuscripts, what you went through to get access to them. Can you just explain one more time? There's mm-hmm. some people that don't know the story. Mm-hmm. Howard had... Nine manuscripts. And what did you have to do to get access to the other... So uh, 19 manuscripts. <laughs> what did you do? Give me just some, just some of it. I, so, I think so it's important. The, so this, let me tell you why yeah. this is important also, folks. We're at the end of season two with this episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can, can I tell them that? Is, yeah. Can I talk about it? I mean, we're clear. We're at it. the end of season two with this episode, which means we did a, a season one, which is one through 12. We did the biblical beatitude series, which it, we called a season on, onto its own. So and, it would make this the end of, of season three. I'm sorry, season three. We go back season, and forth on me, this. Meaning chapters one through four yes. of Matthew would be season one. Yes. The Beatitudes by themselves, five, one through 12 is season yes. two. Yes. And now five, 13 through 19 is, yes. uh, is, season, is, is really a theme unto it's itself. It's a theme unto itself. Season and I think three. if we don't do anything else, what, 15, seven, five, 17, 18, and mm-hmm. 19? Be'et yeah. ha'i, at that time. Yeah. Um, but Nehemiah, so, so, mm. so in getting access to those other manuscripts, which it literally changed the game for us. You said, mm. let's now look at the manuscripts. Right. That was ultimately why you said, let's do Hebrew gospel pearls. Mm-hmm. Let's compare and contrast everything we have. What did you have to go through? So, so here was the out? process. And if I did it today, it would be slightly differently. But the, what I had to do at the time is, first of all, I knew that Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew was part of, uh, or he, Hebrew Matthew was part of a book Shem Tov wrote called Evan Bochan. Mm-hmm. So the first thing as I, I did is I sat down at the National Library of Israel and the Institute of Microfilmed Hebrew Manuscripts, mm-hmm. and I pulled up on their Aleph computer system, which uh, we could say Aleph of blessed memory. because no, <laughs> it, it, it brought it, me down there. It, it, oh, no, no, no. It, <laughs> not just down there. Their computer system called Aleph no longer exists. When there was, a, I was actually there at the library <laughs> in Jerusalem when they announced that they were imminently about to end this system. And one of the scholars who was down there said, you don't understand, 80% of the discoveries, the new discoveries in Jewish studies take place in this room using Aleph. And we've had this system for decades. If you abolish the Aleph system, we won't be able to continue doing research. And there was actually a protest Get out of here. And I was part of this protest Get saying, out of here. you guys can't do this. You can't abolish the Aleph database. Uh, and, and the reason, <laughs> it was incredible. <laughs> Here's a great story, Keith. <laughs> I was, my sister, Ayala, who lives in Modi'in, Israel, invited me to Shabbat lunch at her house 
with her family. She's an Orthodox Jew. And she invited these uh, other folks because they had heard I'm a Karite and they wanted to meet a Karite. So we're sitting down at Shabbat lunch and her friend, uh, who's a woman about her age, says, um, she's there with her husband, and this woman says, you know, I was at the National Library of Israel at the basement in the Institute of Microfilm Hebrew Manuscript, and these scholars were protesting. <laughs> and I said, I was there, and I was one of the leaders of the protest. <laughs> so back up about 15 years before this protest, quite a few before that, I'm sitting there typing away on the Aleph database of blessed memory, and I'm looking for every manuscript of Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. That's number one. And then what I have to do is I fill out this little, pe- this little petek, this little piece of paper, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I hand it to the librarian, and they disappear, and they come back with a microfilm. Yes. And I pull out the microfilm, and I go through the microfilm looking in Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew, for Evan, for, um, or sorry, in Evan Bochan, the book that Shem Tov wrote called The Touchstone, I'm looking for Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's a manuscript of Shem Tov's book and it ends in chapter five and it never gets to Hebrew Matthew. Mm-hmm. Why does it end in chapter five? Because worms came and ate those pages, right? Mm-hmm. right. So it doesn't include Hebrew Matthew. So I go through every manuscript of Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. Of, of Evan Bochan, to find the ones that have Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. And then I say, let me take this one step further. Let me look for everything in the catalog that mentions Brit Chadasha, New Testament, that mentions Matthew. Mm-hmm. And I go through dozens and dozens of microfilms looking to see what they have. And I find all kinds of interesting things. I find there's the Gospel of Matthew, um, in this um, University of Stockholm or something like that, somewhere in, in Sweden. I don't remember where even. Um, I find all these different Hebrew New Testament texts. And then I, and, and, but I'm not finding their Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. And then I start looking for anything that mentions uh, collections, because here, here was the, the Achilles heel. Not everything was fully cataloged that I needed to find. What do I mean by cataloged? So, a lot of times there was a Jew in the Middle Ages who maybe he was a doctor or he was some kind of government official, but he was also a scholar in his spare time. Mm-hmm. And he would go to the local scribe and he'd say, you know, I'm interested in this subject. Can you put together a manuscript of me for me? And these weren't printed. These were custom mm-hmm. handwritten documents. Put together a manuscript for me that has something on grammar, something on Jewish arguments with Christians, something on um, mm-hmm. on, on, on uh, uh, history, maybe a little bit about Bible commentary. And the scribe would go to his shelf and he would pull out different books and he would copy all or parts of those books into this manuscript. And so you have a certain type of manuscript that is a kovetz, a collection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what are in those collections? Sometimes we have detailed information of what's on every page. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes the catalog just says collection. Mm-hmm. So I went and looked at dozens, maybe hundreds of these collections looking for Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew, thinking maybe it's in there. And I found some. Wow. And that's how I ended up with 28 manuscripts. Wow. Once I had those manuscripts, first I had them in microfilm, and then I had to get permission to, um, to um, image them, let's put it that way. And in some cases, back then, the only way I could get images is they'd say, well, we can't give you permission to take a, a photocopy. That's what people could do back then. Because when we, we, you know, we, the Institute of Microfilms, Hebrew Manuscripts, we traveled to the Vatican, and they said, yeah, you can photograph our manuscripts, but only if you agree not to let anybody make copies of them. If they want copies, they should contact us and pay us money. And I ended up contacting numerous libraries. uh, And in some cases, I I bought my own black and white microfilm. This is before digitization. Mm -hmm. And I actually, as we were doing the study, (laughs) <laughs> in the middle of the study, I said, wait a minute, I think I still have some of these microfilms. <laughs> and I went and pulled out from a shelf and I had a box that said microfilms on it, and I opened it up <laughs> and I found a bunch of microfilms. Some of these microfilms I've had for over 15 years. Yep. Yep. And I realized, wait a minute, I have those digitized, but that was digitized back 15 years ago. I could do a lot better today. We have much higher resolution. So I sent them away to, for, to a company. I haven't gotten them back yet. But I sent them away to this company to uh, re-digitize some of those, mm-hmm. those uh, manuscripts. But in order to do the basic work that we're doing, first I had to do that painstaking legwork mm-hmm. in which I spent hundreds of hours yes. looking through things 
99% of what I opened up had nothing to do with Shame Tells Hebrew Matthew, but I wouldn't know that until I looked mm -hmm. through it. Mm -hmm. And I was able to eventually collect a list of 28 manuscripts mm -hmm. that have Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew or portions of Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. So you've gone went through that whole process, Nehemi, and I, I asked you that question because mm -hmm. we're just about to go to the real, uh, what I call the money ball, which is you showing us the process and some of the comparing and, and contrast. And this is an even number episode. Uh, 26. So the so the plus is going to be on the wall.com for real this time. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> and in the plus, we get to share some really cool things that um, we didn't have time to get through here. Uh, I see we're a little bit over time as it is. Yeah. 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 But, but Nehemia, um, the reason I say that it's important, I said I got two more mm -hmm. cards here. I got two more uh -oh. aces for your plus X episode that I want to share with people. Mm -hmm. I want people to understand that the process that we've been going through for years and mm -hmm. the process that you've gone through for years, decades now, mm -hmm. is a painstaking <laughs> process. But man, I'm telling you, the pearls that are coming forward are- Look, this, this are is actually things. something a lot of people don't understand about scholarship. They think it's all exciting and fun. And there's part of it that's exciting and fun, mm -hmm. but 98 or 99% of it is back in the day, sitting in the library, right. Day after day after day, hunched over books, mm -hmm. writing notes, hunched over a computer, writing notes. And today, you know, I said back in the day in the library, now a lot of it's done from home yeah. because of COVID over the internet. But it's hunched over a computer, hunched over books, taking notes. And I've seen, I actually saw this years ago. Mm -hmm. I was uh, at, at Mount Scopus in the archaeology library. And there was this guy who would just sit there day after day after day after day, mm -hmm. as many of us did, reading. And one day he, he gets up and he, and he shouts, Eureka! I found it. <laughs> and this is a guy who had been sitting there for months, mm -hmm. for years, mm -hmm. doing research, trying to put together the pieces of different pottery and, mm -hmm. and look in books and try to find the parallels. Mm -hmm. And one day, just like that, he found it. Wow. And, and it's a lot of that. It's a lot of your sifting through mass amounts of data, looking for those pearls. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to ask a question before we switch to the uh, plus. Yeah. plus. I asked this question um, as I was going through this. Mm -hmm. uh, do you adhere to the words of Yeshua? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to our audience. Do you adhere to the words of Yeshua? Or do you adhere to what people say about Yeshua? What I am excited about with Hebrew Gospel Pearls, working with my friend, Nehemiah mm -hmm. Gordon, scholar of scholars, is that we're looking at what potentially could happen by looking at the Greek, to be mm -hmm. clear, looking at the English, looking at the Hebrew, finding the Latin and everything else, and asking the question, potentially, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. This next verse stopped me in my tracks. If you have not done any plus episodes, if you're only going to do one, please go to Nehemiah's wall for this plus episode. This stopped me in my tracks so much, Nehemiah. It stopped me from what I remember was 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, five and a half years. I got mm -hmm. stopped in my tracks on the Red Letter series until... Wow we could do what you and I and Nelson did. And I'm telling you right now, it, it literally changes the game for me. So you mm -hmm. introduce what happens next and so we can get to the- All right, let, let's, let's pray here. Yehovah, Father in heaven, give us the wisdom as we go forward into this plus episode to share these incredible pearls yes. that you've given us the opportunity and the, and the means and the techniques, the tools to uncover and share with the people. Mm -hmm. Yehovah, I wanna thank all the people who supported my ministry, NehemiahsWall.com, McCore Hebrew Foundation, who have supported Keith and BFAInternational.com, because without them, we couldn't have done this. Without them, we wouldn't have the resources to do this, the time to do this, the ability to do this, the infrastructure to do this. Thank you so much, Yehovah, for those people who are our partners, who are sharing in this ministry with us, who are standing with me on the wall mm -hmm. and standing with Keith, building the foundations. Mm -hmm. This is such a great blessing to us. And through this, may we bless many people. I know I've certainly been profoundly blessed. Mm. Amen. And Father, I want to thank you so much for the process, the painstakingly mm. difficult. Sometimes I've been so impatient. Sometimes I've been frustrated. I've wanted to force the issue, but in your good time, you have given us this opportunity, even through the circumstances taking place over the last year, year and a half, Nehemi and I have been able to dig down, slow down, take a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth look, seventh look at some of these things. And, and it's just it's just humbling 
uh, that you've given me the opportunity to study with Nehemiah and now our study partners that will go with mm. us into the plus episode. These are study partners that we pray, mm. Father, that you will motivate them, give them focus, that we could all study together in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.